I am delighted to welcome you all here today for today's special event at the Ford School, which is also co-sponsored by the University of Michigan's Poverty Solutions. Today's event is part of the 2018 Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Symposium. First held at the University of Michigan in 1986, the two-month-long MLK Symposium is one of the largest celebrations of the life and legacy of MLK sponsored by colleges and universities in the nation. And we are delighted um, to have as this year's theme, the fierce urgency of now. There is no better time than the present to discuss innovative change. And this theme calls on us to claim ownership of the challenges we face and not leave them for others or for future generations to address. Today, we have the opportunity to take a closer look at challenges facing our youth and young adults. We are honored to be joined by my colleagues, Brian Jacob, co-director of the Education Policy Initiative, Luke Schaefer, director of the University of Michigan Poverty Solutions, and our featured guest, my dear friend and a Michigan law alum, who has had the distinction of serving under two US presidents, Roderick Johnson. I'm going to um, say more about Broderick now. You um, all know, I hope, uh, Luke and Brian and can read more about them in, um, in your literature for today. Uh, Broderick is a highly respected partner in the DC office of Brian Cave. And he also serves as chairman of the board of My Brother's Keeper Alliance, an outgrowth of the task force established by President Obama, in whose administration Broderick served from 2014 to 2017 as assistant to the president and cabinet secretary. Broderick previously served as deputy assistant to the president for legislative affairs under President Clinton. And he's had a distinguished career in private practice and on Capitol Hill as well. Broderick and I first worked together more than 20 years ago on community empowerment, focusing on supporting new markets opportunities in distressed communities here in the United States and putting Washington, D.C. on a firm financial footing after years of neglect. I have deeply appreciated over all those years and relied on Broderick's good counsel and wisdom, his D.C. savvy and collaborative spirit, and the most essential feature for surviving Washington, a healthy sense of humor. <laughs> We're thrilled that this is just the first of a planned series of teaching engagements Broderick will have here at the Ford School. I'm pleased to let you know today that Broderick will be becoming a Towsley Foundation policymaker in residence. <laughs> Broderick will be engaging us uh, with us more informally this term. He will be teaching in our PPIA program this summer. Uh, and then he'll be joining us again next winter to teach a course related to mass incarceration. For those of you who are um, students in the room who are interested in research assistant opportunities, um, we will be posting a research assistant um, for Broderick uh, soon. Um, as for today, Broderick will frame the conversation with opening remarks, then we'll have a panel discussion with Luke and Brian. Following the discussion, Associate Dean Paula Lance will facilitate an open Q&A. Ford School staff will be standing in the room with handheld microphones for those with questions. Please join me in welcoming Broderick, Brian, and Luke. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, sometimes I, I think kind of fancifully about moving back to Ann Arbor permanently. And then you have like weather like today, which in D.C. would have caused a whole month of shutdowns. And <laughs> we may have shutdowns anyway at the end of the week. But, uh, but, but anyway, I'm going to try not to be too, too deeply political. Um, emphasis on deeply. I can't help but be somewhat political. These are strange times. It is great to be back here in, in Ann Arbor because um, I love this place so much. It was so important, to, of course, to my development as a as a young man, uh, as a law student, um, two of my dearest friends in the world, 
Um, I was the best man in their wedding, but we were also uh, law in, here in law school together. Greg Jenkins and his, his better half, Patricia Jenkins, are here with me as well. So it's great to, to see you here. And we've come a long way, haven't we? <laughs> when we think about, uh, we were great students, though. I remember that. Right? <laughs> You know, there's something about being a student, you, and I've realized this as a professor, more importantly, is that you, you kind of grade yourself by the effort that you put in. And so uh, we worked hard, but I think in retrospect, uh, we have an even greater appreciation for what this university has to offer, and it is reflected in really, I know for us and our children, and how well they've done uh, in, in college and beyond. So it's great to be here with my friends, uh, Michael Barr, so Michael, there's, he gave you a sanitized version of like uh, what, it, what it was like when we both worked in the Clinton White House, only in as much as um, I had a job in legislative affairs, and Michael was in Treasury at the time, and there was another job that then uh, First Lady uh, Mrs. Clinton needed someone to do around D.C., and I talked my way out of it, and Michael talked his way into it. So <laughs> I'm really grateful for you for having done that. but. Because somebody had to do the job, and, and it was an important job, though, seriously, in turning D.C. around. So, Michael, thank you very much, and thank you for appointing me so I can be here in residence throughout uh, this year and to really work on mass incarceration issues, particularly from the standpoint of solutions. So thank you uh, very much for having me back here. And to my co-panelists uh, today, Brian Jacob, nice to meet you. Look forward to getting to know you. And, and Luke, we've had occasion to get to know each other a bit, and I look forward to the panel today, but working with you as well. Michael, to your, your team has done extraordinary work in making it easy for me to be here today. So thank you all. Um, the significance of this day. So um, today would have been the 89th birthday of Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, to the day. It is, in fact, his birthday. So it's even more compelling and symbolic to be here with all of you today. But we're also approaching uh, the 50th anniversary of Dr. King's assassination in April of 1968, April 4th of 1968. I was an 11-year-old Catholic schoolboy growing up in Baltimore. Um, the riots are still very vivid in my memory. My hometown of Baltimore is still in many ways scarred and recovering from that violence and racial discord from the wide segregation patterns in Baltimore, desperate neighborhoods and broad economic and educational disparity police and community distrust, and of course, the tragedy of Freddie Gray and the unrest that followed. Uh, my friend, and I'm sure you all have read the great works of ta Coates, has written all about these things and has chronicled them pretty powerfully. Uh, Baltimore still, in many ways, uh, presents the lingering and present conditions that in many respects led President Obama to direct his White House and across his administration to establish the My Brother's Keeper Initiative in February of 2014. Hard to believe it, but nearly four years ago today. I briefly want to couch my opening remarks in terms of three things regarding My Brother's Keeper. First, the motivation for President Obama to establish it. Second, what we were able to accomplish in the White House and across the United States over that three-year period. And most importantly, where we go from here. So first, the moment that really drove the president to establish my brother's keeper, and that was the murder of Trayvon Martin. You all will recall that President Obama spoke from the Rose Garden of the White House um, not long after the, the murder of Trayvon Martin. And he said this, among many other things, quote, Trayvon Martin could have been my son, could have been me 35 years ago. There are a lot of kids out there who need help and who are getting a lot of negative reinforcement. Is there more we can do to give them a sense that their country cares about them and values them and is willing to invest in them? I had the opportunity then to speak with the president not long after that and right after the 2012 election campaign. And he talked about how he really wanted to go big, to use the power and the reach of his presidency to better organize how the federal government established programs, made better programs, looking at the disparities that especially affect boys and young men of color, what we in a, as a federal government could do better. And he wanted to also use his power as a convener to bring people together across the public and private sectors throughout the United States. President Obama was very clear that he wanted the effort to be evidence-based, 
to assess the problems and the solutions with the same level of rigor that he demanded in everything else he directed from the White House. So let me take you back to February 27, 2014, um, to the East Room of the White House. That's where the President signed the Presidential Memorandum that established my brother's keeper. There is a compelling symbolism in the fact that he did it from the East Room of the White House that day. Because see, it was nearly 50 years ago to the day to when the President, President then Johnson signed the 1964 Civil Rights Act into law in that same room that President Obama signed a memorandum almost 50 years later establishing my brother's keeper. When you look at pictures from those two days, of course you'll see sort of the traditional gathering behind President Johnson of members of Congress taking credit, um, great leaders like Dr. King, a lot of adults. You look at the picture, though, of my brother's keeper in the East Room of the White House, the backdrop, so to speak, the human backdrop behind President Obama that day was young men of color from Chicago and Washington, D.C. And so he chose that audience of people to get the pens that he handed out that day, for example, to show those young men in the country quite literally that this was about them, that this was a matter of presidential leadership a national priority that was led by a president of profound moral leadership, a president who is profound in his moral character and his leadership, and dare I say, not profane. <laughs> so here's a summary of what we accomplished for the final three years in the Obama White House. At the federal level, focus, first of all, we focused on a different approach. We identified six milestones or stages in the lives of all children and young adults that impact their chances for a successful life. We adopted an expansive and comprehensive approach from birth to mid-20s to examine the data. Because here's what we know, here's what evidence tells us. First, about the word gap. Now this startled me when I heard about this, and so I did my own kind of calculus. It was actually very basic math. <laughs> but the word gap, okay, by age three, Children from low-income households have heard roughly 30 million fewer words than their affluent peers. 30 million. We can also talk about the quality of those words, by the way, because that's also an issue in terms of what these children hear who oftentimes, again, are 30 million words deficient by age three. About discipline pol policy, here's what we know. African-American students represent 16% of the public school population, but make up more than 42% of those suspended more than once, and 34% of students expelled. About college enrollment and success, only 12% of Hispanic men and 21% of African-American men have college degrees by their late 20s, compared to nearly 40% of white men. About employment. A black baby boy born 25 years ago has a one in two chance of being employed today. Now I wanna, that statistic, actually this last one about employment came from a study that was done by the President's Council on Economic Advisors and your own Betsy Stevenson, Pro Professor Betsy Stevenson, who I had the pleasure of seeing earlier today, actually drafted that report for Jason Furman's great team. She actually talked about it in terms of of baby boys, which is an interesting, uh, folks in the African American community especially know about the, the baby black boy kind of terminology. I think there was a movie made about that as a matter of fact, uh, with Snoop Dogg. Was Snoop Dogg in that movie? <laughs> Thank you very much. And Tyrese, oh yeah, how do you know that, right? Tyrese, yeah, okay, all right. Uh, but, those, but the economic point goes to what was a really important character, uh, characteristic of MBK work in the White House, and that is, we could make the case, certainly, that there is a moral obligation, a compelling moral issue around the success of work like My Brother's Keeper, but there is just as important an economic argument to be made about the global competitiveness of the United States and how we need to make sure we're not leaving millions of young men and young women of color off the economic, uh, off the economic field. So again, we developed a bunch of new collaborations across federal agencies. There were 20 federal agencies and White House offices that were involved in MBK. Here's some of the things specifically that we did. 
Second Chance Pell. So the Department of Justice and the Department of Education came together, realized that the Secretary of Education had some uh, additional authority, some special authority, experimental authority to give 12,000 Pell Grants to people incarcerated across the United States. We know the route to, to jail and to prison is oftentimes about economic and, and educational deprivation. So an important way to stay out and to address recidivism is to help people get an education when they're imprisoned. We also had a DOJ and offices within DOJ and across the states, new violence reduction strategies. Also a commitment to ban the box. The president himself directed all federal agencies to ban the box with respect to hiring and strongly encourage local government and private sector employers to do the same. That is to make sure that that box on those employment applications that is so often at the very top about whether or not you've ever been arrested or whether you've ever been incarcerated gets in the way of especially young men of color being able to get an opportunity to get a second chance and to get a job. We also had across federal agencies investments in job programs from the Department of Labor and other federal agencies. And so there were, believe me, dozens of different programs, collaborations across the federal government. The second big approach we took, though, was a community-based approach. So President Obama challenged cities, local government, and tribal nations across the United States to become what we called My Brother's Keeper communities. That meant that they adopted the same data-driven, evidence-based approach and greater collaboration across the public and private sectors to do the work around My Brother's Keeper to, in effect, in many places, revolutionize the collaboration that they were doing. We saw 250 communities across the United States, and every state in the United States have at least one My Brother's Keeper community, as well as the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. Some communities, of course, became exemplary communities, and still are, like Detroit, and Boston, and Houston, and Albuquerque, and there are exemplary statewide efforts that we saw develop in California, New York, and Florida. And finally, with regard to the private sector, again, because for the president, it was very important that this not be seen as a government-based or government-exclusive set of initiatives. Nearly $2 billion in new private sector investments in jobs and apprenticeship programs and technology assistance and mentoring programs came out of the private sector, and we can talk about that a little bit more in the panel. Then finally, a new nonprofit was started and that was the My Brother's Keeper Alliance, and it was begun in May of 2015 by a group of business leaders who wanted to develop and support <laughs> efforts inspired by the president's own vision. It was our hope and our expectation out of the White House that this nonprofit would be so well developed and organized when we left office that President Obama would embrace it post-presidency. President Obama was always very clear with folks about one thing, and that was that the work would not end for him, the mission was not over, when he left the White House. And so we hoped that My Brother's Keeper Alliance, this nonprofit, would be the vehicle for that. And in fact, it has become the vehicle for that. So where do we go from here? Well, first it starts with the My Brother's Keeper Alliance. It is now not an independent nonprofit, so to speak, not independent from Barack Obama. It is now part of the Obama Foundation. It is one of the central components of the Obama Foundation's work going forward. Um, I am honored to serve as the chair of the advisory group, and it is made up of many of the original board members from the private sector. And here's what we'll be looking at. We'll be looking at making significant investments in a small number of MBK communities. We don't have the federal government anymore, of course, you all know. Uh, I don't know if this new administration has realized that they have some responsibilities around the My Brother's Keeper work, although it's perhaps framed differently. But we certainly can't wait for that to happen. And yet we don't have all those resources, so we'll focus on a smaller number of communities. And we're going to bring greater attention to two major measurable outcomes. First, supporting mentoring programs to close the gap between the need and human capital. There are tens of thousands of young people of color who need mentors. There are tens of thousands of adults who want to mentor young people. But figuring out how to bring that match together has always been challenging. We're getting great help from the National Basketball Association and Mentor Inc. around that work. And the second big part of our strategy will be to support violence reduction strategies proven to work across the United States. So those will be the two big points of emphasis 
for the My Brothers Keeper Alliance work out of the Obama Foundation. Uh, let me close my, my beginning remarks with this. So I had a whiteboard on the wall of my office in the West Wing. Uh, one of the more amusing moments was when Reince Priebus, who was about to become chief of staff, wandered into my office, I think two days before I was going to leave, and he looked at the whiteboard. And I had these expressions, one of which I'll describe. And he said, well, what's, what was that for? And then I knew it was time for me to get the heck out of there and pack my stuff up and, and leave. <laughs> because uh, it was, how do you explain something like this? One of those expressions was to, quote, make exceptional lo no longer the exception. Again, make exceptional no longer the exception. Look, I continue to be personally unsettled by the fact that in many ways I'm still seen as the exception to the rule. And it's like the black guy who comes in the room who's got great education and is raising a great family and, and this and that, and I look around and it's just me. And we have to change that so much. My own sons and my daughter experience some of the same stuff when they go into environments where they are the only ones and they are seen as the exception because they are exceptional. A lot of that, though, is uh, reality, of course, but it's also a perception about boys and young men of color and girls and young women of color in terms of their exceptionalism because there are you can call them diamond in the roughs or whatever, but there are millions of, exce of exceptional young people of color that we just don't notice for their talent, we don't invest in. So we gotta change that. And while so much of our nation has changed since 1968, believe me, an awful lot has changed since 1968, we know we still got a long way to go to change realities, break down barriers, and hold on to hope. Remember hope, the hope posters, because for a lot of our young people, they remember President Obama is giving them great reason for a lot of hope, I dare say, for us chiseled old, uh, well, anyway, <laughs> professors as well. Uh, we got to recognize that exceptionalism. We got to bring investments to that exceptionalism and make sure that we're not continuing to leave millions of young kids behind in this society. So anyway, those are my opening remarks to frame this discussion. Again, it is great to be back here at the University of, of Michigan. Uh, I can't stay for the game tonight, but I will look forward to seeing the score when I get home, because Go Blue is set as often in DC as it is here in Ann Arbor. So thank you all very much. Hello, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, uh, Dean Barr and Paula and uh, Broderick and uh, everyone else for being here. Um, I am uh, I'm honored to be uh, included and I'm excited to tell you about some of the work uh, that um, some faculty colleagues and students and I are doing. Um, it is going to be on a program called Grow, De Grow Detroit's Young Talent, and I will uh, tell you what that is in a moment. Um, so uh, this, is, this work is being done by the Youth Policy Lab. Uh, this is a kind of applied research center that a few colleagues and I started about a year ago. The idea is to create partnerships with local and state agencies um, and to do research that is really applied and really relevant, um, something that I think is you know, not common and not particularly easy within the academy to do. Uh, we're focusing on areas, education, healthcare, juvenile justice, and workforce development. Um, and we're going to be providing all sorts of kind of data-focused uh, technical assistance, including need analysis and program evaluation. So this is one of our first partnerships. This is with a program known as uh, Grow Detroit's Young Talent. This is Detroit's version of what kind of many of you are probably familiar with, summer youth employment programs. Um, and uh, this is run by two uh, Detroit city agencies um, uh, with a variety of funding, federal, state, private sector dollars. And youth work approximately 20 hours per week for six weeks during the summer. 
Um, in addition to this work, there are, are, is a few hours of kind of training in a variety of areas ranging from workplace readiness to financial literacy. Um, and the work experience that the youth get uh, you know, range quite a bit. And this is one of the ways that I think Detroit's program is a bit unique and kind of more interesting uh, and innovative than other programs throughout the country. Um, the typical summer youth employment program is one where youth have kind of jobs with community-based nonprofit organizations, uh, often of the, of the type that kind of I've uh, described here, child care, you know, kind of community beautification, community service. Um, Detroit has that, but then when they started um, and started to increase the program several years ago, they made a big push to involve the private sector more. Um, they've received a lot of private sector uh, funding, and funding in the, in the sense that <laughs> private sector companies agree to take on, you know, 10, 20, 100, you know, even more youth in some cases. Uh, there are career pathways, which are internships, Quicken Loans, Touchpoint, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, and others. Um, and there's also industry-led training, which is kind of some sort of on-the-job learning uh, that provide youth that are interested um, uh, more tangible kind of workplace skills that may coincide with some high school career technical education uh, that they're getting and maybe a pathway into kind of subsequent uh, post-secondary education. So uh, what, do we, what do we know about how summer youth employment programs influence youth outcomes? So these programs have been around uh, for many, many years. So in that way, they're not kind of new per se, but we really, as in many social programs, there's been few studies to help us understand really uh, whether they are effective or more importantly, which types of programs are effective for which types of youth. Um, some recent work in New York City, Chicago, and Boston has found uh, mixed outcomes. So the, I guess the headline that I think is extremely important but I think hadn't been appreciated before is that there were big effects in kind of violence reduction. And this is, you know, uh, maybe most uh, well known in Chicago. Um, there's been some rigorous evaluation that suggests that participating in these, this summer youth employment program in Chicago reduced violent crime arrests by 43% among uh, young males in the city. Uh, and importantly, this was not just during the summer, so it was not kind of uh, what the criminologists called an incapacitation effect. It wasn't just them doing something else during that summertime, but the vast majority of the effect was actually in the subsequent year following that summer employment. Um, uh, but there haven't been really noticeable effects yet on educational outcomes or labor market outcomes, and that really is where Detroit is kind of interested in um, uh, generating some change. And so we uh, agreed to this uh, partnership with the Detroit Employment Solutions Corporation and City Connect. We're kind of helping them compile a variety of big administrative data sets to look at um, how applicants and participants compare to other youth in Detroit, and then how that participation influences educational outcomes. Uh, so I'm gonna uh, present just a little bit of the work, uh, what we've learned so far, um, and then in the Q&A, we can talk about kind of the upcoming plans. We're working to develop an evaluation for summer 2018 um, with some other colleagues, including Trina Shanks at the School of Social Work. I'm not sure if Trina is here, but she has been a, um, uh, a key partner putting together a survey to gather a lot more information about uh, youth that participate in the program. Um, and actually, this is a, a perfect time. Uh, what have we learned so far? Before I tell you what we've learned so far, I think it's very important that I tell you who the we is. And actually, I am a very small part of the we here. So the we includes the incredible uh, partners we have, but also some of the students and staff that are in the room, Kelly, uh, Lovett, Jasmina, Max Gross, if he is here, who really did a lot of the analysis that's underlying the results. So thank you. Uh, to all the students and staff that have uh, helped make this project possible. Um, uh, so what have we learned? Well, so first, uh, youth participants come from across Detroit. This is a heat map. Uh, the darker the area shows you kind of the greater density of uh, participants. 
Those of you who know Detroit, Detroit well will kind of recognize some of these neighborhoods. Um, but it really is spread out across the city. And so I think that's a, a testament to the outreach um, of a variety of the city agencies and the community-based organizations. Um, how do the applicants to the Summer Youth Employment Program compare with other Detroit youth? Uh, they're more likely to be female, uh, slightly, kind of 56% versus 40-something you know, percent. Um, uh, they come from slightly less disadvantaged, though still extremely disadvantaged neighborhoods in an absolute sense. Kind of uh, applicants come from uh, uh, neighborhoods with poverty rates of around 31% relative to other Detroit youth. And interestingly, those youth that seek to apply to the program um, uh, come in with you know, better academic preparation than other Detroit youth. So I think it's, um, this is you know, highlighting some of the successes, but also the challenges of the program. I mean, it's certainly um, getting some very well-prepared and kind of motivated youth, but it, it still hasn't, you know, it's still not reaching maybe the most disadvantaged Detroit youth, um, which is you know, you know, actually a quite common problem in a variety of social policies, getting to really the, uh, the kind of most disadvantaged individuals. So, um, so uh, this just a quick slide on methodology, what we're doing. There's lots of fun statistics behind this, and I'll be more than happy to talk with people about this afterwards. Um, this is one of my favorite things. So, um, but uh, just quickly, what we're doing is we are comparing youth, um, trying to compare apples to apples, youth uh, who participate uh, same gender, same race, same grade level, same high school, and same eighth grade test scores as youth that don't participate. So if you have a young uh, ninth grade black male who scores at the 60th percentile on the national distribution uh, going to um, Renaissance High School in Detroit, we'd have a, you know, an observationally identical youth. This is what the, the language is. Um, from the same high school, same year, uh, who didn't participate. And that's who we're trying to uh, use to draw the comparisons. So, oh my goodness, we've got uh, technical difficulties. Um, so, uh, in short, I'm going to show you there really are you know, some encouraging, very encouraging positive results that uh, come out. So, chronically absent youth, uh, youth that apply but didn't participate, this number here is 33.1%. Um, chronically absent means in missing roughly about 15 to 20 school days per year. Um, so a third of the youth, even those relatively high performing motivated youth that applied were chronically absent in the years following, their following that summer compared to only about 30%. Um, of youth that participated. So it's kind of improving attendance and you know, slightly reducing chronic absenteeism among uh, the youth. This is really the signature headline. In fact, I'm going to, uh, okay, we'll, we will uh, persevere here. Um, so graduated high school. Uh, if we're looking at 10th and 11th graders, this is youth who apply right kind of going into their, after their 10th and 11th grade year, and then we can follow them for two years to look at what fraction of them uh, graduated, which would be kind of on-time graduation. So 82% um, of youth that applied but didn't participate graduated um, on time kind of in four years. Um, some, you know, a few percent of those are still in high school, um, uh, but the majority of that 18% have dropped out. Um, and, but 87% um, uh, a difference of five percentage points, 87% of youth that participate in the program uh, go on to graduate, and even kind of a larger number are still in high school um, after five years. So uh, this, is, uh, this is very encouraging kind of in the world of social policy analysis. These are, you know, kind of uh, moderate size effects. You know, this is, and when we think about what we could have expected from a six-week you know, summer program, it really is, I think, quite encouraging, kind of given, you know, potentials for expanding and 
extending the program in certain ways. So this is um, uh, what we found so far. Um, where are we going from here? So we're going to, our goal is to continue to work with the city agencies to help them use data to support their continuous program improvement. Um, kind of we have like a five-step model here, and I'm going to just go through. I'm not good with the uh, animation. Articulate objectives, define outcomes, pilot, evaluate, refine, and then do it again. And so this is kind of what we've started to do with them. Hopefully our first um, kind of piloting and evaluation will be this uh, summer. Uh, working to refine after that, um, and extending some, some of these, you know, preliminarily encouraging results. Um, and that's just the, the randomized evaluation we're planning for summer 2018. So uh, that's a kind of a short description of a program that I think is, um, is making an important difference in Detroit and has, even more importantly, some <coughs> potential to be even uh, better. Um, now, Luke is going to continue uh, to talk about uh, related programs in Washtenaw County and then bigger and more important themes uh, after that. Which one is yours? Is that yours? Yep. Okay. Right. Okay, we've uh, now arrived at the least distinguished uh, panelist uh, in the collection. <laughs> It's always a little bit daunting to speak after a, a dude who uh, has cab former cabinet secretary uh, after his name. Uh, I will say I got the, the chance to visit Broderick in his office at, in the White House, uh, uh, I think maybe a couple times. And it did sort of, as you entered it, it did leave you with um, a, f a familiar feeling to when you were entering an M-Den. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure there was a... A Michigan lamp, uh, a, a Michigan football helmet. There's like a big picture of Bo on the uh, the wall. So thank you for being uh, an incredible ambassador to uh, the University of Michigan. Uh, so I was doing a little bit of time just sort of reflecting on a date uh, like today when we're um, celebrating the contributions of a giant like uh, Martin Luther King and. Uh, uh, just had three sort of thoughts uh, that maybe will contextualize um, my comments here. Uh, the first was, uh, I always remember going down to Atlanta to the uh, Martin Luther King uh, Museum and, uh, and, and space and uh, getting excited that I was going to get to see his Bible. I knew his Bible was on display and for some reason I imagined this very pristine sort of Bible since faith was such an important uh, uh, element of what he did. And when I saw it, it was like the most ragtag uh, thing, you know, pages flipped over, it was beat up and stuff. And, uh, you know, it just sort of made you think of someone who like really used it, right? That's where he drew his, uh, his faith from. Uh, the second thing that I've been reflecting on was that the, the guy was short. I think he was, I think he was like five foot eight, uh, maybe. And, and in, in my mind, it's just important to remember that because he's such a giant now, right? And, and he's made such an incredible impact on uh, the trajectory of the country. And he was just a guy, just a person like the rest of us, right? So I think remembering that, uh, you know, uh, we can all make contributions that, that matter uh, and that his call is, uh, continues to be so important. Uh, one last thing I've been thinking about is reading a book about... Um, Richard Nixon, and the two of them actually had a very sort of long-standing relationship. Uh, uh, Dr. King uh, was sort of uh, trying to nurture that relationship for a decade or two uh, over the course of the time that they were in the national uh, limelight together. And so it just reminded me that uh, uh, great idealists, right, people who have great visions uh, can also be politically savvy, right, where he was obviously trying to do the same thing with people on the other side. So uh, the, for about the last year, my staff and I have been uh, moving along with a university level initiative called uh, Poverty Solutions, which is situated here in the Ford School. And Ford School is an incredible um, uh, home for us. Uh, and the goal is to really try to bring the uh, resources of the University of Michigan to bear on one of our most pressing problems uh, in the United States and globally, poverty. 
uh, and to try to get beyond a lot of the important work that we've done here at U of M of uh, understanding the, uh, the scope of poverty, the causes and the consequences, to really try to be in partnership and find new ways to prevent and alleviate poverty. Uh, and, and so we uh, uh, are about a, about a year in, and uh, I'm excited that we have uh, research projects that we're helping to support across something like 13 of our 19 schools and colleges across campus. And you can really see sort of the breadth of the interest in doing really concrete work uh, out in the community. Uh, we have a lot of work going on in the city of Detroit, which I th think makes a lot of sense. Detroit is one of our nation's uh, poorest cities. Uh, but there's obviously a lot of strength and opportunities there, and so trying to be in partnership with the, the city government and be in partnership with uh, community-based uh, stakeholders to see what kind of value added a place like the University of Michigan uh, can bring uh, is important work. But as we started also doing this work, I started having a lot of conversations across uh, our community. Um, one thing that kept on coming back was that uh, when we want to look at poverty and inequality, we don't have to go very far uh, outside of Washtenaw County. So I think uh, it won't be news to us. A lot of us are aware uh, that here at U of M, uh, a high fraction of our students, in fact, one out of every 10 U of M Ann Arbor students comes from the top 1%. Uh, well, that's a greater fraction that come, than come from the bottom 40%. Of, of the income distribution. And Washtenaw County itself is among the bottom 10% of all U.S. counties in terms of recent mes metrics of inequality and social mobility. So getting to know uh, folks at uh, the United Way, uh, getting to know some of our, our partners in uh, Ypsilanti in particular, right? Ypsilanti, we're uh, just, you know, not far away from where we are right here, has pockets of poverty that look an awful lot like uh, places in, in Detroit and otherwise, uh, and uh, starting to hear sort of this sense and this feeling that uh, maybe sometimes the University of Michigan jumps over problems that we have uh, right here in our home county uh, to try to get to places that maybe have more name recognition, right, or sort of more universally recognized. So um, I think uh, here at U of M, we're starting to address some of this stuff. and then, I think uh, uh, President Schlissel brings in a, a, a significant commitment to uh, trying to do better, right, especially with this data point number one. And some of that is a result of uh, research uh, and ideas that have come out of the Ford School with the Go Blue Guarantee, which stemmed from the, the Hale Scholarship, where we just uh, significantly changed the way that we communicate with uh, students from low income schools who we think could get into U of, U of M who disproportionately have been um, opting out of applying, right? Because we think they often think that they couldn't afford to come to a place like the University of Michigan. And so the Hale Scholarship was this uh, experiment where they sent very simple materials. Uh, I think of it as like a coupon that said, if you apply and get into U of M, we will provide free tuition, right? And the response was incredible. Now, we didn't actually add more money, is my understanding. We simply changed the way that we communicated about the availability of financial aid. And as Sue says, it has to be around this notion of guarantee, right? We're going to assume some of the risk. Um, and so because we did this experiment, we saw that the difference was, was quite striking. And that's led uh, U of M to, uh, to commit to the Go Blue Guarantee, uh, which is uh, you know, a program for, uh, that says anybody who comes from families with incomes below $65,000 comes uh, tuition free for four years. And again, it's this guarantee that I think Sue thinks is so incredibly important uh, that we're assuming a lot of that risk and making, it, making a very complicated process sort of more simplified. We have another uh, exciting program going on called Wolverine Path Pathways, which is a college prep program for uh, students in low-income schools starting at seventh grade, right? So it's going to try to follow students um, uh, throughout uh, the rest of their time in school and get them into U of M at higher rates. Um, for my own work, I knew uh, about this research on summer youth 
employment programs. Uh, I knew that Brian and Trina were working in the city of Detroit. One of the things that really struck me was uh, that in the city of Detroit for Grow Detroit's Young Talent, uh, they get something like uh, 15 or 16,000 applications uh, for this, right? So uh, the idea that there, uh, this to me speaks to the fact that there's a lot of demand uh, for programs like this if they're one, known about, and two, accessible. And in my own work, uh, through uh, uh, some research, qualitative and quantitative work that I've been doing trying to understand what's going on at the very bottom of society. Uh, I had seen, um, you know, as we talked to families, in, the case, in my case I was talking to low-income families in different parts of the country, whenever I would ask if we came back and you were doing better in a year, uh, what would it look like? Uh, none of them would ever tell me I want more uh, cash assistance or I want more uh, government aid, although I happen to think that we should have those programs available, right? They've, uh, to, uh, to a person, they would say, I'd like a job paying 10 to, to $12 an hour that offer, st offer stable hours uh, in a place of our own. And, and so I think uh, there's something that resonates with a program like summer youth jobs uh, and with uh, people, right? It's acceptable. It's something that uh, uh, meets people's um, needs and I think maybe enhances dignity. And, and so we, uh, as we're, as, as my associate director, Julia Weinert says, you know, as we're sort of launching Poverty Solutions, uh, we also uh, decided to launch a summer youth jobs program here at U of M. Uh, so in the summer, a place like U of M has basically any job available that you could think of, right? Uh, so we have jobs uh, working in research with, with faculty members, office jobs, uh, jobs in buildings and grounds, uh, jobs uh, providing uh, child care right over the course of the summer in some of our child care centers. Uh, and so we were thinking of this as maybe a way that we could really leverage the resources of the University of Michigan uh, to uh, provide you know, access to opportunity that wouldn't otherwise exist. So we partnered with Washtenaw County and Michigan Works. We partnered uh, with the Youth Policy Lab that knew a lot a lot about uh, the, the best practices on these types of programs. Uh, the Ginsburg Center was an important partner uh, that uh, uh, directs, sort of coordinates service learning across the U. And in the first year, we created eight-week paid placements for youth ages 16 to 22 in jobs all across campus. Uh, and you know, I think one of the nice things ab about this, one of what we thought was one of our strengths, was uh, that uh, if you get connected to the University of Michigan, you also get connected to a lot of resources such as um, uh, an M card that can get you on the bus for free, right? And all of our students got set up with a, a U of M credit union account uh, that, uh, uh, so everybody was banked by the end. And uh, we set up Friday enrichment sessions that covered a, a, a range of topics such as conflict management in the workplace and how to apply to college. And we're gonna be looking in year two to figure out what else is there here at U of M in terms of training opportunities that could be delivered in conjunction with a paid work placement? Uh, and I think maybe most importantly, we connected all of our youth to a success coach. Now, this is something that maybe you, you probably can't do when you have 9,000 placements across a large city, uh, but there's a lot of research suggesting that this sort of success coach is someone who you can connect with in a moment of crisis uh, uh, if you can't get to work, right, or if you um, are having trouble managing a conflict with a, a supervisor, uh, can help you sort of figure out, sort of strategize the best ways to, to deal with that. Uh, and, uh, and we think that that was an incredibly valuable part of the, part of the project. All right, well, um, uh, as with any time that you roll through, uh, a new intervention, you learn a lot. And I'm not going to take you through this flow chart, but I just wanted to, to uh, highlight just a couple th quick things. One, when we, um, uh, when we got 220 applications and we were pretty sure we could only place 100 uh, kids, uh, we felt pretty good, right, that we were going to have way more than we needed. But by the time we got to our first orientation session, we were down to 64 youth. Uh, and, and so, uh, I'll, some of the kids uh, we just never heard from, 
uh, some were underage, some were excluded. Uh, and, and so I think it speaks to like how challenging sometimes this can be and how the assumption that if you build it, they will come doesn't always work out. Because of our success coaches, right, we're out uh, you know, on the ground, we were able to bump those numbers back up to 108 youth uh, that were randomly assigned at U of M. We had a program and then the county had a program. And once we got uh, our students into jobs, our youth into jobs, we kept all but one of them through the course of the rest of the summer. So really it was a matter of uh, getting to the point of the first day of work uh, that uh, we were having to figure out what some of the barriers were uh, and then uh, through the rest of the summer, we had pretty good success. We only at this point, because we had relatively small samples, know about how they felt about the program. And we were pleased that, the, that, the, that they felt better equipped to do things like apply to college, right? Uh, that makes a lot of sense at uh, U of M. Uh, and I think something that we're going to think of as an advantage going forward. Uh, they felt better prepared to uh, apply for jobs. And 96% said they were better prepared to interview. And uh, the program had a lot of sort of experiences of both doing a, a short interview at the beginning of the placement and building a lot of those skills over the summer. Um, uh, just two notes that I wanted to say. Uh, you seem to like the program a lot, uh, but they very much did not like it being connected to something called Poverty Solutions, right? <laughs> Makes a ton of sense, right? And a, a name like Poverty Solutions, I think, resonates uh, with a certain crowd. Uh, but trying to understand how we're communicating these things and, and what we're doing uh, is, uh, you know, even as an expert on poverty, this one caught me off guard. Another thing is we think of this as much sort of building knowledge for youth, right? Helping them with success and also building knowledge here at U of M. So we had a lot of youth who would come back to their sessions and say, is anybody else in placement where everybody else is white? Uh, and, uh, and I think the enrichment sessions were really helpful in helping uh, youth navigate that. And it speaks to, I think, uh, where we have a, lot, uh, a long way to go here at U of M uh, to, to keep on going. And a final thing I just wanted to mention was we're thinking a lot about the right level of targeting. So one question is we could make this a program that strictly serves low-income youth. Uh, or last year, because we had extra placements, we increased the span of uh, students uh, uh, a little higher up the economic ladder. And we think uh, maybe the targeting does a disadvantage. Maybe we shouldn't be creating programs that only serve low-income youth, but try to uh, bring kids together from across the income distribution. So we learned a lot, a lot more to go, uh, and uh, we're looking forward to next year. Thank you. Hello. Hi, I'm Paula Lance, Associate Dean for Academic Affairs here at the Ford School. And it's going to be my fun to uh, help moderate a now discussion Q&A session with our amazing panelists. Uh, let me apologize um, at the outset here. I doubt we're going to have enough time to get to everyone's questions. And I also know for sure I'm not going to be able to keep track of who raised his or her hand in what order. So I will do my best. Kind of we'll make our way uh, around the room. Uh, and uh, please um, uh, keep your uh, questions or comments pretty succinct so we have time to get to as many people as possible. And I'm just going to open it right up. Who has something they would like to ask? Sylvia. I wanted to make a comment. Testing, testing. Okay. I just wanted to make a comment about Luke's uh, remarks that uh, the students didn't like to be tied to the notion of poverty solutions. Many years ago now, Claude Steele, who was an African American social psychologist and the author of the notion of stereotype threat, and he mm -hmm. ran a program here at the University of Michigan in Markley Hall for gifted undergraduate minority students. And his argument was that students didn't want to receive a letter saying, you know, you have been chosen because you are a minority student. Mm -hmm. They wanted to receive yeah. a letter that said you have been chosen because you are an excellent student, you know. And so I, I think it does make a difference to, you know, students' sense of self-worth and how they 
to enter and function in the program. Great, thanks. Yes. Um, I was wondering if you guys can talk about how you go about getting funding and sponsors to work with you on these projects. Well, certainly with respect to My Brother's Keeper, um, uh, there are still some federal resources that come, but a lot of it really is coming out of the private sector, um, either through local governments. You know, the Grow Detroit Young Talent Program, for example, is part of MBK Detroit, and to see the investments that have been made by the private sector to provide uh, apprenticeship programs and summer jobs is just critical to being able to continue this work. And in fact, there's a responsibility the private sector has. We also receive, receive some foundation money, and a lot of the local um, MBK communities get a lot of foundation, local foundation and national foundation money as well. Um, we need a whole lot more money, though, that's for sure. And so now that President Obama can raise money for my brother's keeper, it should be a tremendous boost for the resources that we can provide. How about do either Luke or Brian have anything yeah. to say about, about funding? And can I just put a little twist on that, too? We all, we all know that programs come and go, even programs that have really good evaluation results, and they often go because there's a lack of sustainability for funding, yeah. so that's a really excellent question to think about um, ongoing committed resources to keep programs we know work going. So I can speak uh, very quickly to uh, one thing we debated as we were uh, starting out was whether or not Poverty Solutions, which has a budget from the uh, U of M, should pay the wages of the youth uh, to work in the different departments, right, or should pay some uh, fraction of it. And in the end, we actually said, well, let's see how many placements we get if we just ask the departments to pay the wages. Uh, and we got uh, offers of 77 placements across the U, uh, and of course could only um, actually field 40 youth uh, in the first year. So um, this, of course, I think is uh, unusual in that uh, you know, uh, doing a placement for eight weeks at, at uh, $9 an hour with something like $1,800 doesn't seem like a lot of money to a U of M <laughs> department. Of course, this is a, an affluent place. But I think it does speak to the importance of thinking, trying to be strategic about your revenue streams uh, from the start. Because we could have very well, I think, decided that we, you know, we could have made the decision at the front end that we needed to pay for the placements. And, uh, and then we would have been sort of locked into that. I think we would have set up an expectation going forward that we were gonna uh, pay for the placements. And uh, because we didn't do it, which I think was partly a matter of luck, right? Uh, from our point that that's what we decided, um, we saw that people were really across, across the departments were really to field this cost and I think it makes it at least look more sustainable to, to the U rather than having to say, we're going to dedicate 100000 a year chunk. And, and with Grow Detroit's Young Talent, that's, you know, this is a, an interesting thing um, of like who does play the placements. And of course, then you have to look at the evidence to see uh, what that means about uh, if, a, if a private employer is paying the placement, who are they serving as well, right? Right. <clears throat> I mean, I think so the Youth Policy Lab gets funding from foundations and some kind of uh, research grants. Um, yeah, and I, and I think there are trade-offs. I mean, it's exactly true in the, uh, the employer-sponsored internships in Grow Twins Young Talent. They are kind of very selective, um, and they have kind of minimum academic criteria, and then they do interviews in kind of a career fair where they select the youth that they would like to work for them. And I think that, you know, again, like, like many things, there's trade-offs. In some ways, that really is a nice simulation of the job search, um, and it's uh, a realistic setting, and um, uh, it helps kind of youth get prepared for that sort of market, but it may not be serving some youth that kind of aren't as prepared at the beginning. Um, uh, right, I mean, I'll, the, also, the other quick thing with, well, I'll stop there. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, go. Okay. All right. I actually have a program, for, I mean, sorry, I have a question for you, Ryan. For the research evaluation for how the program has worked, oh, I'm sorry, can you hear me? Is that yeah. better? Okay. 
for the research results that you showed for the program for Detroit youth, how long was that research evaluated? Was it just a one year and then people asked their questions? Because I actually participated in that program when I was in high school, which was yeah. several years ago when it was the Detroit youth program or whatever right, it was. Right. Um, so what were your results in terms of timeline? So the, I mean, this, uh, the results I presented were just for youth who participated in summer of 2015 and summer of 2016. And they were kind of uh, impacts after two years. Okay. So in either 16 or 17. Okay. Um, now I forget who mentioned it, but he talked about having a gap between those who want to mentor and those who are in need of mentors. Um, so both she and I work for Big Brothers Big Sisters of Washington County, and we have an extremely hard time to get volunteers and bigs, as we call them. So with their having so much need or want to be a mentor, we're trying to find out how can we get to those people who are wanting to be those individuals. So that, are you familiar with Mentors Inc? Yes. That organization? So. Um, they're putting uh, uh, a lot more resources into exactly this this issue of helping to identify people and setting the expectations of people who could be mentors. But look, uh, I don't know how many of you saw the Seth Curry video with President Obama. It was last year during the NBA uh, finals. Um, that got, and it was about being a mentor, and it's kind of funny because it shows President Obama helping Seth Curry learn how to shoot better, and, and <laughs> but, but the number, but there were there were several million people who viewed that uh, video over and over again, and we saw an uptick in the number. So we have to use influencers uh, who can help, and in this area, whether it be Michigan um, athletes and um, and also and other leaders here, or be like the Detroit Pistons, uh, we we can draw more attention to the great need. But it is a great need. There's no question about that. And let's make sure we have you connected to the Ginsburg Center. Is Sarah still here somewhere? Okay. Sarah, uh, I think in, yeah. Oh, okay. Already connected. Great. Great. Thanks. Oh, okay. We have a question over here. Oh. Hi. <laughs> uh, I um, run a youth program in Detroit called, called um, Mosaic Youth Theater of Detroit. And what we experience, and many other youth programs in Detroit experience, is that the greatest barrier for low-income youth is transportation. Um, I'm just wondering, a lot of the transportation innovation that's going on nationally and in Detroit seems to be based on 18 and older. Um, any thoughts about what is happening in terms of addressing the, the transportation gap? Uh, I, I, so I don't have any specific ones that you know, that I'm aware of. I'm sure in some of these MBK communities, they are addressing the transportation issues. And I understand you, that Detroit, historically anyway, has had some very unique problems that are getting, that are on a, a better better path to getting fixed now. But uh, specific to other ones in other communities, I'm not sure about, is Detroit fixing its transportation issues? Some. Well, <laughs> well you know what, President Obama used to always say, so uh, better is good. So let me start with that. Is it better? Okay. Yeah. All right. For, for large groups of young, for long large groups of young people, there's no no discernible impact, positive. Well, yeah. Okay. So I'm hoping that we're going to start to see some change there. So we just seeded some money for some some folks at the engineering school that's working with the new mobility director in the city. Uh, around looking at some alternative models uh, to really serve better. Uh, the folks at the engineering school think that we can tighten up our bus routes and connect people to bus routes with personalized shuttles and reduce costs and uh, commute times. So I think we're, we're trying to be our own guinea pigs on this. So we've been rolling it out in the U of M system, which actually has a ridership that rivals the city of Detroit, I guess. Um, and, uh, and so we've just provided some additional funds to do the research they need to figure out how they set up those systems. So uh, we definitely think it's a critical issue. You know, you see it for school, you see it for work. Um, and, uh, and so we're investing some in it and we'd like to, to do more. So we'd welcome ideas. Thanks, Jeff. Hi, so my question is more for Mr. Johnson. Um, so I actually had the fortune of taking uh, Professor Lance's program evaluation course and one of the things that we talked about was the ban the box movement and how there are some people who are concerned that despite the best of intentions there might be unintended consequences uh, where men of color potentially have lower employment rates in places where the box is banned. 
uh, due to concerns that um, because they're no longer able to filter out who potentially did have a felony or was incarcerated, uh, they use color then as a proxy. So I was wondering what your evidence has found and how you can potentially try to get more to the foundation of the problem if Ban the Box maybe doesn't uh, get the whole solution. Yeah, I know there was some research that someone at uh, either, I think it was at Brookings did some report uh, at uh, ad addressing this particular problem about ban the box. And I, I guess I would say we've seen studies, we've seen evidence of the opposite, quite frankly. And, and sure, I mean, is it, you know, it's a, is a, so it's against the law, right, to use uh, race as, as a factor here. So if that law, if it's being uh, violated by employers, then they are exposing themselves to civil rights violations. I don't know if uh, you all saw the New York Times story yesterday, though, about um, because we're in an almost full employment uh, yeah. economic situation that uh, so many employers are now hiring people who are incarcerated or formerly incarcerated, and and th so the dynamic has changed considerably, and so and therefore ban the box issues. I think from certainly from a uh, from a corporate perspective not forced by government, uh, although I think it should be, certainly dictated by government, and many local governments do that. But we're, we're coming to a different place because of the uh, unemployment rate. Now, we're not gonna stay at this, uh, at this rate of un unemployment, and we're gonna certainly see, at some point, a downturn in the economy, so the importance of ban the box doesn't go away. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you guys so much for telling about the wonderful work that you're working on. My name is Camille Tynes. I'm a youth and community development consultant, born and raised in Detroit, and so this type of work is my love. Um, my question is, we've been hearing so much about the new innovative approaches that are taking place, these amazing programs, and even seeing some of the statistics and the reports are like, oh, this is great. Um, my only caveat or concern is how much community collaboration of all participants of the process are included. So not just say certain funders or key stakeholders or amazing U of M, but actually the people that are being served. Because I know oftentimes, like I've worked in roles from being a youth specialist to program evaluation and even doing some contracts and grants management. So that's allowed me to see that oftentimes the numbers paint a pretty story, but then when you get to the on the groundwork, or you, you actually see like your local or national outcomes, there's a disconnect. So my question to you guys is, so you're talking about how you're recruiting so many youth, but sometimes there are issues of retainment or things of that sort, or like what are those barriers? If say youth or whoever you're serving um, is included, not just in the survey, but in the long-term process, say maybe, not just in a focus group, but more like, I don't know, like a board of directors, or whatever, however you would term it for what you're doing, but in the long term, a collaborative approach to see where can we problem solve and how can we implement better? And is that something in the works right now? So we insisted in the development of these local action plans that communities would send us uh, to the White House uh, to say they wanted to be an MBK community that uh, part of us recognizing, and we didn't give awards for it, you know, although that phase may come later. Again, it was more self-identification, but we said, from the start, if you're going to submit uh, uh, a, basically a request that you be an MBK community and tout yourself that way, that you have to demonstrate that you have youth involved in your efforts from a leadership perspective as well. So uh, MBK Boston, for example, of their board of directors of, I think, 15, two of them are youth who started when they were high school students. Uh, so any, any effort. A, a calling itself MBK that does not involve youth, not just as sort of the specimens, mm -hmm. right, the, the, to measure the impact, but also to help develop the effective programs isn't worth its salt. Yeah, uh, we're trying to approach this in a number of different ways and figure out um, uh, what the, the best ways to engage across a number of levels. So I think uh, with our uh, with our summer youth program at U of M, uh, we're getting feedback from and very close partnerships uh, at a, a lot of different levels with the county, with the county government, with nonprofits, and with youth in particular. Uh, I think we'd like to start drawing success coaches from previous participants, right, as a, as a way to really connect the experience. Um, in the city of Detroit, I will say uh, we're hiring an outreach uh, director who can be on the ground. I think. Uh, 
being more connected. Um, but another thing I'm super excited about is the work by Liz Gerber and Jeff Mornoff on uh, the uh, Detroit Metropolitan Area Community Study. You guys could mention to them that the name's a little long, and they should maybe <laughs> tighten it up, if you wouldn't mind. Um, <laughs> But uh, they, they just received a grant from the Knight Foundation. Uh, and, and the model is that we're going to, uh, we've constructed sort of a random sample clustered in communities. And we're hiring Detroit residents who will then canvas those communities to get us uh, on the ground sort of uh, representative information of how people are seeing investments in the city. Um, uh, we think that the community uh, members who are going to be part of the outreach group can help tailoring the questions, right? So we piloted this last summer, and uh, you know, uh, a lot of language that made a lot of sense to nerdy professors like me, where they were like, yeah, you know, maybe we can change that a little bit. Uh, and so we'd like to institutionalize that. And I think it gets at a lot of what you just said. One of the things that I think about a lot in the, the first wave of that survey, they found something like 60% of Detroiters knew someone who'd been evicted recently. So. Uh, you know, I think getting a sense of like the magnitude of the hardship uh, is is key, and uh, getting a sense of how people are perceiving what's going on in the city really can help um, uh, develop policy. So, but I think we have to do it at a couple different levels. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is kind of a follow-up question to the transportation question that was asked earlier, and it's inspired um, because. I think a lot of the times under-resourced youth feel the need to sort of escape from their communities because they think that there's no hope in getting any help from their um, local communities. And I was just wondering if there's any efforts being made by any pro of these programs that were talked about earlier in perhaps desegregating school systems or um, finding more equality to um, disperse the resources to all schools instead of a certain number of advantaged youth. Um, you know, there, I think there's, uh, there are not a lot of kind of formal efforts toward school integration uh, these days. In fact, kind of recent research suggests it's kind of, it's been going in the opposite direction. A lot of districts that had been under federal consent decrees to, you know, actively desegregate in some way, those consent decrees, which are 20, 30, some even 40 years old, are being kind of lifted. Uh, I mean, I think prim the primary way public school districts think about integration now is through um, open enrollment systems or schools of choice, which is partly maybe charter schools, but also partly any other public school in the district. Um, most kind of big urban, big city urban school districts have fairly well developed choice systems that allow students to kind of go to um, any number of schools within the, in the district. Uh, the downside there is transportation. I mean, it's often, you know, the, the, the freedom to go somewhere isn't very useful if you can't get there. Um, uh, and the other issue is that it, it is only within the district. And a lot of kind of residential segregation over the last 30 years has taken a place, you know, across districts. And so even if you would perfectly integrate the Detroit Public Schools Community District, um, it wouldn't be nearly as integrated on race or socioeconomic status as you would want now because of residential segregation. So it's, I mean, it's a big, it's, it is no, not a very easy, uh, there's no easy solutions. A minute left. <laughs> Quickly, thanks. Yeah. So uh, can I say something about uh, what I have found uh, deeply uh, troubling about uh, the school system in my hometown of Baltimore? Um, you probably saw some of the national reports of what happened there over the last couple weeks. 
because of the, the incredible cold that we, that we had on the East Coast, yeah. that 60 of the Baltimore schools um, didn't have heat for a period of three or four days, and yet the, and these were elementary through high schools. And this meant that six and seven year olds were in 40 degree temperatures in classrooms for days. And you could see icicles forming outside the building. And 86% of those children, it turned out, also received free and reduced or reduced lunches or meals. So they needed to be in school. <clears throat> um, but you had this, this really um, unacceptable, I think, kind of um, uh, blame game that was going around where you had uh, administrators of the school system you know, saying that there were all sorts of infrastructure issues that were legacy issues that they inherited, and then you had uh, other folks, other adults saying, you know, it's kind of not our fault, we'll fix it. But for the children and their parents, going to your, your issue about self-esteem, I mean, it just seems like, you know, adults shouldn't be given excuses for that ever happening, and if it does, fix it immediately, rather than, uh, you know, four or five days of children being subjected to that. It does make a big difference. And yet so much then of the work that President Obama has directed goes to alleviating those institutional issues that get in the way oftentimes of children having even the most basic options. So at least they can have after school related programs um, where they can feel like someone you know, cares about them or they have a mentor they can, they can turn to. Great. So. Thank you. Let me wrap up by doing three thank yous. First of all, Mr. Johnson, thank you for coming you. today. Welcome. And uh, <laughs> coming to the Frostbite Falls of Michigan and um, taking time out of your busy schedule, but also thank you for being willing to come back um, and be a Towsley policymaker in residence. We are all beyond thrilled, so that's fantastic. Thank you, thank you to Brian and Luke for also sharing their experiences and expertise. <laughs> And also, I want to thank all of you for coming, and I also want to thank all of you in this room. I know many of you in this room are engaged in doing work to make the exceptional no longer the exception. So thanks for coming today. Happy Martin Luther King Day, and thank you all very much.